county puts, you know, because when I hear about drought tolerance, I think of water. Are we talking more about, when we talk about drought tolerance, about the climate than we are water, or, or is, it, is it kind of a combination of both or, or that we're talking about? Well, so I'll start. So it's a combination of both. I mean, so what, so what happens is, as Jennifer said, cotton has optimum temperature of, of, of 28 degrees centigrade. But we still grow cotton, right? Even though it gets to be 104, 110. I mean, we lived in Lubbock when it got to 114 that one year, right? So, so cotton has to deal with that. But if you have it over an extended period of time, thermo physiologically it can't deal with it. But so you have to deal with temperature. And then because of the high temperature, they can't pull in enough water. And that's the drought part. So it's both the temperature response plus the drought response. Yes, sir. Question, but Jennifer, maybe I'm asking for a simple biology lesson here. Um, that would help the rest of us too. Um, <laughs> water for plants, or for that matter, for animals, <coughs> is, is, is two things, right? Transportation and cooling. Is that the main function of water? I mean, um, we, we all know that plants need water, but why? But because why do they need water? Yeah, it's to transport the nutrients for growth, for and cell plus, elongation, and cooling too. And right? cooling. Mm -hmm. Anything else, please? Yeah, two more. Um, source of electrons. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that that? And also, um, perturbator so that the plant can actually display its leaves. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will just fall over. Mm -hmm. So they, it's, it's, it, it's essentially ballast, right? Some sort yeah. Of, well, yeah. Right. Some sort of, so sort of uh, balloons up so it can um, spread itself out. Well, the reason I ask that is all of those seem fairly irreducible. And you're talking about these genetic modifications that can reduce their requirements for water? Mm -hmm. That Some of them will show, we do water use efficiency trials, and we can see that they hold their water better than some of the wild type that don't overexpress the genes. So, but, I mean, that, that, there's some point where it runs out of water, it's going to die no matter what. So, so, so the, what this, these genetic modifications do is they, they, they keep the transfer, transpiration break down and then so it doesn't dissipate into the air as quickly? Is that, is that how it works? Right. Right? It just helps them kind of regulate their osmotic potential a little bit better. Or may, I don't know about the stomatal conductance. We don't always know what it, every pathway is doing, but mm -hmm. it does seem to give it a better chance of survival by overexpressing some of these genes. But I wonder how much, how, what, how much can, can more tolerance can you get out of these plants? I mean, it would seem like you know, water is here. Like I said, there's no substitute for water, and those functions, those four functions seem uh, that you can't do with less. So. Yeah, well, we're looking at rain-fed plots. So it, we did some last year in the field, and I think there was, what, like a full 30 days where mm -hmm. we didn't get any rain, and the plants were just being hammered, but you could still see them flowering, holding their turgor pressure, still yielding bowls for us. Whereas some of the wild type, they would flower, but then the bulls instantly drop off because they're mm -hmm. trying to sustain their energy, so they'll drop the bulls off. So that's part of what we're looking at is the yield. We want higher yield, so if we can increase some of the drought tolerance, it helps with the yield. So one of the other ways to deal uh, with, with, with water, Ken, and, and Chuck may know more about this too, for, for any landscape, there is what's called effective precipitation. And that, image, and that is how much of the water that actually hits the soil goes in besides and, and doesn't run, run off. So farmers always want to increase effective precipitation. You want to increase effective precipitation around your yard. And that's why when we had um, a, somebody talk about you know, water gardens and landscapes, they were talking about how do you capture all the water on your, on your yard so it stays there and doesn't run off into the street. That's why you know, that, that's why Texas Tech floods, that's why Lub Lubbock floods, because we may get an inch of precipitation, but that inch that doesn't go into the ground. Sometimes hardly any of it go, goes into the ground and just runs off. So one of the things that Debbie and I, you know, do, and I have some handouts actually, for those, how many of you compost? So a, a fair number of you compost. So I'm gonna pass this around. This is some compost of ours. So one of the other aspects of having an effective landscape in Lubbock is to increase your soil organic matter in any way, shape, or possible that you can do it. So we do it by composting. Um, we do both a combination of pot and cold compost, but all of our yard material, all of our kitchen scraps, all of our kitchen water goes onto our compost bins. 
And what, what the organic matter does is build up soil structure so that when rainfall does come, it has a chance of uh, percolating in and doesn't run off. And that's one of the ways that you can actually change. We may only get 18 inches of rain, but in most yards, 10 of it goes away and runs off. So you're only dealing with eight inches. But if you can increase that to 14 or 15 inches by adding compost and changing the soil organic and so changing the soil structure, you actually can have a much more effective landscape than you do now. And you don't have to cover it in gravel then, right? You have to, but you have to be able to work at it. And that's part of the dynamic of trying to figure out in Lubbock what's going to work. Well, now, soil organic matter is not, is not the magic bullet that's going to correct all the problems. But interestingly enough, Jennifer was, you know, Jennifer was talking about increasing water capacity of a plant. The microbes that are in the soil, the beneficial fungi, actually help a plant deal with water better. And they can control it. So not only do you can modify the plant genetically, you can add your own soil microbiome that keeps that plant functioning well, even when it's stressed. You know having a good gut microflora, you're less stressed. But having a good microflora in your soil also impacts that also. But that takes practice, and that takes compost. That takes not adding pesticides and herbicides. And that's, 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 the, that's the advantage. I'm really glad you mentioned the uh, effect of rainfall. Uh, we do a lot of record collection from farms in the area. And we calculate uh, water use efficiency of the various crops. <clears throat> and you can do that using your total amount of water from rainfall and total irrigation. But we also calculate it on the basis of effect of rainfall, and we give it a 50%. As we say, on about 50% effective. Um, and but what one of the things that we uh, want, to, well, that we're seeing is that more farms are irrigating less because their well capacity is going down, or they're converting to to uh, dryland crops. Well, for dryland crops, it becomes even more imperative that you bump that effective rainfall percentage up, and we want to get up to 70, 80 percent or so. And so uh, you know, leaving crop residue, crop residue management, uh, having cover crops is a way to help uh, mulch that soil, but it's really hard uh, to do on a large scale. And especially when the producers are used to using these, all this big equipment and, and they're afraid that cover crops during the winter are gonna be exhausting the soil water profile. Uh, but we've got some, some more recent research saying that that's not necessarily true. Prove it is that we can have cover crops, less evaporative losses, and not uh, uh, decrease uh, the summer crop yield. And so we want to be able to keep fine tuning that. And, 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 and the same is true, you know, soil, whether it's in a cotton field or in your yard, works the same. But soil is, so the question is, how do you manage it? And so I also, we have printed out, Deb and I printed out some stuff. Um, there was one on the, on the organic approach in terms of compost myths. But there's also, there's also a, for those of you that don't compost, there, I have a plans for a three bin turning unit for compost. So if you're interested in using it, go ahead and, go ahead and, take, and take one of those. Jeff. We still have potted plants that I brought in last fall mm -hmm. in our house because we always have that late freeze like you were talking about. But our last freeze, I believe, was early February this year, so I just feel like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, we had we put everything out in pots and then had to pull them in on Friday night. I did that too. <laughs> well, and I remember what she what what, what somebody said about you know that 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 you know when it says all sun all the time. We had we had two pots on our on our back porch that pretty much got because it faces north and so it kind of got sun on it. But it had like basil, oregano, all good. and also we looked at and and half the pot was just growing. You know, I say growing like weed, but that would be ironic. You know, just and, and half of it you know was brown and crispy, so we had to bring it back in. <laughs> You know, and, and it brought it back up. So yeah, so uh, so even stuff that you know, even it doesn't have to be a flower. It could be a, you know something right. like that that is that has to you know it's not it's you know not in this sun. You can't you know because if if, if the human's going to bake, the plant's going to bake too. Patricia. So what advice do you have for the variability on compost? Because part of my 
difficulty with my compost. Of course, I'm in Dallas, but we still have the same high variability, right? right. Um, is then it'll just rain a whole bunch, and then it'll just be sun and bake it all. And so what kinds of you know, advice do you have for keeping the compost in good shape? In, in, in terms of variability as well. You mean in terms of making it or using it? Well, or both. making it really. So, so one of the things, so a compost pile, um, in, order to be, in order to be effective, has to have a certain dimension. That compost pile has to be three by three by three feet. That's the minimum size it has to be in order for it to work, yeah. right? So you have to have three by three. The other thing you have to have is you have to have a 25 to one ratio of brown to green. If you have too much green material, it, it, it tends to go anaerobic and start pumping out nitrogen, start pumping out ammonia. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you, so you have to balance what you put in there as, as brown with what you have as green. The other one is composting, for the most part, is an aerobic process. So we do have to, you do have to turn it and turn it regularly. But even with the rain in Dallas, you should be able to make. Um, but I don't have, I have it in bins that are all wood. So it, and it sits on our east facing fence so that it doesn't get a lot of sun and it's underneath part of a tree, because otherwise you're right, it's just gonna cook. If it's out in the open, it's just gonna bake. And it won't, so what you're gonna end up doing is killing the microbes that need to be in there because of their heat stress. But one of the things we do, um, you have to add, if you're gonna use it to control surface temperature, you have to add at least two or three inches of compost to that surface. And what we're, we've been finding is shredded leaves actually work as well. And it's because a lot of people, you know, will throw them out, but. You know, we used to go around the neighborhood collecting leaves, and we didn't have enough at our own house. Now we have too much, and our neighbors all blow in. But I was going to give you some. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question back here? You may also have a question. I got a question for, for Deb. Uh, if you could have a wormhole in, in your house, and, and anytime you want to go someplace in the world and garden and then shoot back without losing any time, where would that be and why? Uh, we have a farm outside of Madison, Wisconsin. And we're up there for a maximum of five days a year right now, which is a travesty. But what, during those five days, we plant plants, and we get the farm looking great. And we leave, and on the whole, the rain and the soil structure is such that it stays pretty all year, uh, until the freeze. But at the farm, we've put almost sticks into the ground, and they've grown. It's got a sandy soil instead of a clay soil like we have here. So you can dig and the roots can branch out. Um, the heat stress isn't there, the rain stress isn't there, the water stress, so yeah, that's, that's in our future, I hope. I was gonna say, is there cold stress though? There is in the winter. I wouldn't wanna live there in the winter, but boy, that growing season is pretty wonderful. Mm -hmm. Seen a mosquito or two? Or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly enough, not, not as much as we have here. Mosquitoes? Yeah, we have more mosquitoes here than we do uh, up at the farm oh. in Wisconsin. Oh. And part of and and part of it is, uh, even though there's a lot of water on, we tend it to uh, sit. it it doesn't sit right, and it's always flowing, and there's not a, there's not a big mosquito problem. Yeah, the now the playa lakes here are bad. About right it. Yeah. now. Ticks and chiggers, right? <laughs> yet you care for. But yeah. Yes, sir. Could you talk about why soil goes hydrophobic? Yes, that's an yes, where it sheds water, so it will shed water, and that's particularly true of soils around here. Uh, no, what happens is is that as when rain hits it, it and there's not a lot, it'll it'll tend to crust up a little bit, and because of organic matter too that those, the, 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 the organic material plus the small silt that sits on top will shed water initially. And that, so, so one of the things you can do, if you, if you want to test this, go outside in your yard where there's not much grass or something and just pour a little bit of water on and it'll beat up. And the reason has to do with, with, just, the, with just the nature of, of, of grass leaves and blades and the fact that our soils tend to have a build a crust on, on that. And so, when it, so one of the problems where we have a lot of um, runoff is because initially, if you have a heavy rain, it won't soak in because it just sheds water. That's where soil organic matter come, comes in. If you have enough organic matter, 
you don't build up that kind of response, crust. the crust, and it'll, it'll infiltrate. Now, interestingly enough, that's why this ratio of 25 to 1 in your, in your um, compost is so crucial. One of the things that happens with grass clippings is once they die, or dry, excuse me, it's very difficult to re-wet. And so you have to keep that turned, and you actually have to physically go in there and, and water and move it with your hands. So if you have grass clippings in your compost right now, and you don't water them or turn them, they will be in there when you die. <laughs> because they will not decompose. They will shed water as much as possible. And that's just the nature of that plant material. <clears throat> You die, you can just join the conference. That's, <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's what I said. Yes. So, so you've seen that response too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I read somewhere in a magazine they were trying to sell me some something called yucca extract, and they claimed that that would keep it from going hydrophobic. So what's interesting is that Amway does sell a product, which is a, um, which is a soap mi mixture that you can spray and it'll break down that, that hydrophobicity, it's called. Um, and they sell it for golf courses. So they sell it around, but the problem is, when you're adding a soap solution to soil, you are affecting the microbes in it too. So you have to keep doing it. It's like putting sugar in your coffee. Once you've tasted that, you have to keep putting sugar in your coffee, right? <laughs> so you're gonna have to always spray that on your golf course. You can do it, I mean, try it. Just make up a little bit of uh, detergent and spray it on a pad, patch of gran, let it, let it wet, and then add water next time, and your hydrophobicity will all go away. Really? Yeah, and you know, it's just the nature of, uh, of, of, because water's a polar molecule, grass, particles and, and other material is has charges they just it just beads up and but but that's also why we, we live on this planet because water is a polar molecule yes, I just had a practical question so you said you used a lawnmower to shred the leaves but I'm trying to imagine it because I've never I've not done it but don't the leaves just disperse as soon as you try to go for it no you have to bag them so we have we have a bag so you have to have a bag and just, and, and uh, I set the mower so it's about two inches above and just go over it and it'll shred them up. Now what's interesting is that it will not work if they're wet. So I never, when I grew up in Pittsburgh, we never ran over leaves with our lawnmower because they were always too wet in the fall to shred. You couldn't shred them. So all we did was rake them over to the back of the yard, going into the woods, let them sit over the winter and they were composted by the next spring. We never had to do anything, right? Uh, but here, it takes you half a day to get your compost stuff together, just because of the climate. We have a new um, cordless electric lawnmower, which is lovely. You just take the battery out and stick it in the charger. Um, but my husband says the thing that he doesn't like about it is that it doesn't have as much power as mm -hmm. the gas mower did, and it's not like the gas mower would suck up the leaves, Right. and this is not pulling them up like your gas mower. Right. Yeah, yeah, you know, we've, um, we've bought some cordless things to trim various things over the years. In fact, we just bought a little Black & Decker um, cordless trimmer to do our monkey grass, right? Rather than going after it with a weed whacker, I wanted to do it this, and it, it, it doesn't have enough power long enough to be able to move it. Yeah. I'm a person who laments <coughs> the loss of particular words in English language. They become archaic or people don't. They don't, they, they, they don't know what they mean, but there's a word that fits back into this uh, hydrophobicity and be able to allow the water to soak in, and that word is tilth, T-I-L-T-H. It's a word that soil scientists and farmers used a lot back in the olden days, mm -hmm. and I'm almost to the point where I could talk about olden days. <laughs> but, um, so, but, but tilth refers to the workability and the structure of the soil. And it, it's not just organic matter, but it's a combination of uh, fine and coarse organic materials and it's a mucilaginous uh, uh, material that helps bind things together, uh, fungal hyphae and so on. And, but a soil that has good tilth would be one, for example, that uh, evolved under, um, under grasslands, which this used to be here. And so when those grasslands were first turned over, they had excellent tilth. And when it rained, water infiltrated. Now, so much of this topsoil has blown away and been oxidized away. And so a lot of our lawns are that kind of soil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, 
but, but that word, uh, you know, think of ways which you can use that word the next few days. That's your homework <laughs> assignment. <laughs> so. You know, that's a good point. One of the things I think uh, I was surprised to learn during the summer in the United States, 40% of the um, material that goes to landfill are grass clippings. Now, that's cut back because of places like D.C. and Chicago and Philadelphia asking people to, you know, to keep it out. But, but again, there's no reason to back up your grass yeah, clippings. Absolutely. Run it and just leave it in, in your yard. You want to build good tilth and get organic matter into your yard? Don't bag them up. You can bag them up to clean up initially, but just let it go. What's interesting about the farm, we never fertilize, we never put pesticides on or herbicides. Um, it gets cut with a rotting lawnmower. Somebody comes in and cuts it every couple of weeks, and it's the best lawn ever. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the fact that it just recycles what it, what, what it has. And, it, and interesting enough, there's enough nitrogen falling out of the rainwater in Lubbock to fertilize your yard adequately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more question. Um, so, have you heard of this? This is a, a sort of a gardening question. Um, you know, with the swimming pools are also one of these really big, big users of water and like evaporation and leaking. And, and I, I saw recently that there's this um, plans that you could buy to convert your swimming pool into like a um, garden, greenhouse, mm -hmm. garden. Have you seen this and does no, this I work at, at all? Uh, I mean, uh, I can uh. imagine, I, I was just fascinated by it because, but I thought all of that concrete, does that actually work or in no. this part of the country or would it be something like not that viable in this climate? I, I mean, obviously, I mean, you, now you're going to, you're going to have to deal with the, with the amount of heat buildup in any unit here, but as long as you have some way to keep it cool and move air through it, uh -huh. I don't see why not. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, the concrete itself is not going to be a problem. Talking about an in, in yeah. pool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they didn't want they they, you know, yeah. every every house you see now has a pool. But if you don't want a pool, you can buy this kit that that converts it converts it into like and a, into a greenhouse. A Ooh. greenhouse. Oh, that's pretty. Yeah, all you all you need is just if a top works. onto it. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, I'm not giving up my pool. No, the water's not too good. Our, ours is actually is, is, is kind of half in, half out. We've got a deck built around it, so it's, and it's and it's not a concrete one. It's one of those it's it's one of those that's kind of lined oh, metal. So lined. so so it's actually up probably about yay high off the ground, but it's deep enough. It still goes into the ground. So it's mm -hmm. it's an interesting. It's kind of half in, half out. So the and also maybe in closing, one of the, those of you that are entrepreneurial, because that's a word we tech likes to use these these days. <laughs> you know, I get horticulture and have gotten it since 1970. Um, but this is where you have garden envy because of what people can do. <laughs> but, but, but one of the problems with this magazine is it never addresses the kinds of issues that we face here in the Southwest. It does a little bit, uh, but not very often. So those of you that like to garden, it's probably time to do something for the Southwest or for this or for the Southern High Plains and start putting on some things about what really you can grow and do in this kind of climate. Because interestingly enough, um, I think it was Chuck said the other day we were at a meeting. You know, what we have here in Lubbock, about 33% of the world deals with at the same thing. So anything we can do has a big impact. And with climate change, more of the U.S. will probably. That's exactly right. <laughs> Barbed wire grows well here. Yes, yes, it is. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give our uh, panelists another round of applause. Thank you.